good evening. Y'all ready to make this happen tonight? Let's, uh, let's stand and sing a little bit. He is jealous for me. He loves like a hurricane. I am the tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy. All of the sudden, I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory, and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. Oh, how he loves us so. like a hurricane I am the tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and know oh, how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us all yeah he loves
what I prepared and uh, I prepared and I prepared and then I didn't even take the second page out for this song so welcome welcome to living with Greg open up the sky Skies of mercy and rain down the cleansing flood, healing waters arise around us. Hear our cries, Lord, let them rise. It's your kindness, Lord. Desire. It's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. Your love, your love is better than life. Turning our hearts back again. Hear our praises arise to heaven and draw us near, Lord. Meet us here with your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. Your Desire. Your beauty, Lord, makes us stand in silence. Your love is better than life. Try singing that without any coughing. You ready? I'll try my hardest. It's your kindness, Lord, that leads us to repentance. Your favor, Lord, is our desire. It's your beauty, Lord, that makes us stand in silence. Your love. Your love is better than life. It's better than life. It's better than life. It's better than life. Dear Heavenly Father, we just, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity to come before you. Father, God, I thank you for the opportunity to serve. Um, I just, just thank you that all we're required to do is get up here and give you our best, is go do what you told us to do and give you our best. Uh, even when our best isn't good enough for us, Father, we just thank you that, that you look on us with so much compassion you give us so much grace and mercy as we walk through our lives 
So we look forward to what you have for us tonight, Father. Uh, you are a good, good God, and you are worthy of our praise. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. All right. Well, good, uh, good evening. Wednesday night service. Back in Exodus. We never left. Um, but uh, there you go. So, hey, um, we'll get these lights up for you guys so you can actually see what we're going to be talking about tonight. We'll be in Exodus chapter 19. So if you guys don't mind turning over to there. I know we met last Wednesday, but it doesn't feel like it to me. I'm like, did we actually? Yeah, we did. Um, we did. It seems like a, I don't know why, we just, that just hit me as like, oh, that seems like a, like a year ago, it feels like. Um, hey, just real quick, just uh, a couple of announcements, um, just because they're pertinent to what's happening in the immediate future for Calvary Galveston. We have our nursing home service that starts this Saturday, okay, so it's the 8th, so it's this Saturday, 10.30 to 11.30 is kind of the time frame, show up uh, over there at um, 10.15, 10, no later than 10.15, if you do, 10, after 10.15, Joe's going to start stressing and sweating, and we don't need him to do that, okay, so get there early, um, there's... If, if you're thinking about like, well, what am I, what am I going to do? There's plenty to do, okay? The biggest thing would be um, kind of uh, just mingling with the residents because um, we don't want to just show up there, sing some songs, um, do a Bible study, close up, head on out. That's pointless. There's no point in doing that. That's just, I mean, that's the word. It doesn't return void. That's great. But then you leave a bunch of people like, Oh, okay. So um, we want interaction. So uh, I would just encourage you guys to be praying about that, um, who the Lord may be directing you to specifically, um, what individual that just needs some, maybe just some fellowship. Uh, maybe they've been locked up in a nursing home for over a year and haven't really had anybody to talk to other than whatever, you know, wonderful nurse or uh, whoever may be coming in to check on them. So uh, so that's a huge part. The, the worship's big. The, the word is, is, is major, but the relationship and the interaction is, is a major, major part of this thing. And praying with them and all that good stuff, helping them to find the right page in the, uh, hold on now, the Baptist hymnals that we'll be providing. <laughs> that I've never thought I'd be saying those words. Um, Baptist hymnals. Um, we'll be, I just fought the rats for them uh, up in the attic. So um, we, uh, we will have them, but they'll be uh, needing, you know, just help maybe in finding the right, the right page for the right song and all that good stuff. So really uh, a lot of opportunities to help out and just in the most precious and sweetest way possible. Um, it's really a cool thing. It's almost like a reverse children's ministry if you think about it. Um, and that's what's so cool about it. Uh, and that's the greatest thing about children uh, in our experience. And we, Nellie and I started off teaching three-year-olds, and then we either graduated or got demoted. I think it was demoted to junior high uh, and then to high school. But um, the three-year-olds and the junior hires had this common thing. If you just paid them any attention, they loved you. They just loved you. The high schoolers, you had to earn it. You had to earn it. Um, so I think with, uh, with our friends over at the nursing home, we're just showing up to love on these guys um, and to give them some much needed attention. And so that's, that's a, a gonna be a major way for us to, to help out. So that's once a month starting this Saturday, okay? So you can go ahead and mark your calendars for the second Saturday from here on out um, where we'll be doing a Saturday service with our friends at the nursing home. Okay. Uh, the other thing, just to put it on your radar, I'll announce this again on Sunday, but we have a, a, an intern from Calvary Chapel Bible College who's going to spend the summer with us, uh, and he needs a home. He needs a home, okay? So um, just be praying about that. For um, he's, he's a great kid. He's, he's really excited to be here. He's also very nervous. I talked to him on the phone, and uh, he seems like he's a little nervous, which I understand. New place. You know nobody. He barely knows me and Nellie. Um, barely. Uh, but uh, he's going to show up for the summertime, and, uh, you know, he'll probably get, like, a part-time job. Uh, and he's just, he's excited to be here to be involved with what the Lord's doing here in Galveston. So be praying for Nate, and that Nate can have somewhere 
a place to live for three months. Um, and then, you know, after August, we really just kind of put it in his hands and the Lord's hands and see what he wants to do. If he falls in love and he doesn't want to leave, then that's cool. Hopefully we want to keep him here because uh, then it gets weird. But um, no. uh, but hopefully if, if it all works out, you know, um, that's, it's, it's in the Lord's hands. He's a good God. He's a sovereign God, um, which is what we've been talking about on Sunday mornings. Um, that's for my friend Jeff. He is a sovereign God. Um, but he's also, it, we also see that in the book of Exodus. And that's where we're at today is how like amazing and, and just incredible God is. And the children of Israel get like a front row seat to the awe factor of God. Okay, so chapter 19, if you could turn there, if you're not there, you can go ahead and turn there now. I'm going to pray and we're going to get, we'll get right into this, uh, this chapter. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this night. We thank you so much for loving us. Um, I, I thank you, Lord, for, Lord, even for that, that last song, um, your kindness. It's your kindness. It truly is your kindness that leads us to repentance. And, and Lord, I'm just, uh, I'm grateful for that. And the times where I've experienced that within my own life and my walk with you, um, Lord, and just, uh, just a reminder of how gentle you are. You are a God of justice, but you're also a God of kindness. And, uh, and Lord, there's, it, it's, it's amazing. There's this reverence, this uh, proper fear and respect that we want to have towards you, Lord. Um, but then also, Lord, to know that you're our Heavenly Father. And uh, amen, Lord, you're, you're so good to us. And so we just thank you for that. Thank you for this evening. Thank you for a chance to open up your word and to, Lord, we just want to hear from you. So we pray that you would speak to our hearts tonight and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So we just went from Exodus 18. That's where Jethro, father-in-law to Moses, shows up, uh, witnesses the day in and day out activity of Moses and how like absurd it is, like the things he's trying to accomplish. Um, you got a million people. There's no way in the world you can judge and rule over this many people on your own. It just doesn't make any sense. So Jethro advised Moses to, you know, to raise up some guys, to delegate responsibility. And that's what Moses ended up doing. You'll, we'll see later on um, if, if you progress through the, uh, the rest of the Pentateuch, the, the first five books, you'll see that an, another plan does get instituted where 70 elders are raised up and all that good stuff. Um, it doesn't mean that Jethro's plan failed or was a bad idea or anything like that. It's just, it's just the progression of it. Um, when we get there, who knows? I have no idea. Um, we'll <laughs> one of these days, we'll make it there. Um, but we, we got to see this, and, and Moses received this wisdom from his father-in-law, and, and he put it into practice, uh, and that's a good thing. And then now we kind of, the scene begins to shift towards Mount Sinai itself, um, which just to remind us, Mount Sinai is, is the mountain of God. This is going back to Gen or Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 3. This is the burning bush. This is the scene where that whole story took place, the mountain of God. And God told uh, Moses, I think it's in verse 12 of chapter 3, that he was going to bring Moses and the children of Israel back to this mountain. And this, is, this comes true, Exodus 19. This is the word of God coming true. God said, I'm going to send you to rescue or to deliver the children of Israel from, from the Egyptians. That happened. And God got them from there. And now he's got them to this place. It's called the mountain of God or Mount Sinai. Um, he's gotten them there. And that's another just fulfillment of God's word. And when he says he's going to do something, even a simple little thing like that, that uh, to be honest with you, I have totally forgot. And then I'm reminded of it today. I'm like, oh, yeah, even the simplest things, when he says he's going to do them, he just does them. He does them. And so it's just another reinforcement that when God has told us, this is what I'm going to do in your life, he will deliver on that promise. Now, he never said anything about Mara and the Red Sea and all this stuff. He didn't have to because Moses didn't need to know that information right? You don't know all the pit stops along the journey. You don't need to, right? You just got to stay focused on what he's already said and believe that that's, that's what's going to happen. So verse 1 of chapter 19, it says, exactly two months after the Israelites left Egypt, they arrived in the wilderness of Sinai. After breaking camp at uh, Rephidim, 
Rephidim, or however you say that, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and set up camp there at the base of Mount Sinai. Then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God. The Lord called him, called to him from the mountain and said, give, the, give these instructions to the family of Jacob. Announce it to the descendants of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You know how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Okay, so here, here's what God, he's recounting for the children of Israel. This is what's, uh, what's amazing is Moses goes up this mountain and, and he and God are, I mean, there's this, this conversation that begins to take place there. It's not so much of a conversation, but really just God speaking to Moses really into the children of Israel. And he's saying, look, this is what I did for you. And he's establishing the covenant. He's establishing a covenant with these people. And he's like, look, this is what I did. I rescued you, I delivered you, I got you here so that I can establish not so much some rules, but some guidelines. This is how it's going to be for you guys as a nation going into a land that is rightfully yours, but it's occupied by some other people who live totally contrary to everything that God lists in the, the law, okay? So this is for their own benefit. Anytime God lays down some laws, it is for your own benefit, okay? It's not because he's a curmudgeon or he's mean and he doesn't want you to have any fun in your life. No, it's because he's, he knows better than us. And he's like, look, if you indulge in these things, you will be harmed as a result. So he's laying this down for the children of Israel. He goes on to say, verse 5, Now, if you will obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my, my own special treasure. I love that. I love that. New Living Translation, I, I really appreciate that. that and and what, what he said to the children of Israel, I believe, can be directly applied to you as an individual in 2021. If you obey him and keep uh, his covenant, keep his word, basically, you will be my own special treasure. That's a good word. I don't know when was the last time you were called a special treasure. <laughs> maybe never. I don't know. You may have been called special, but maybe not a treasure. All right. So I, I've, I've, I've heard that, you know, for a large part of my life. You're, you're, you're special. Um, thanks. Uh, but God says, no, no, you're my special treasure. You're my, you can be my special treasure from among all the peoples on earth, for all the earth belongs to me, right? So God is, he's, he's establishing the foundation. I rescued you. I delivered you. You listen to me. You obey me. I own everything. I own all the world. There is no other gods. He proved that in the, in the story of the, the plagues of Egypt, all the quote-unquote gods, he smashed them all. He's like, I own the earth. I own the earth. It's mine. So he's, lay, he's laying down the, the, the foundation here. He says, and you will be my kingdom of priests, my holy nation. This is the message you must give to the people of Israel. All right, so he delivers this to Moses. Moses is now going to have the responsibility of going down and communicating this message to the children of Israel. But what a message it is. Hey, listen, God wants you to listen to him and obey him. He considers you to be his special treasure. You're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. That's, that's amazing. And here's God who's been dealing with nothing but complainers this whole time since leaving Egypt. Even before, he, before they left Egypt. They were complaining against God. Isn't it, it's such a great thing when we can take a step back and, and you get a viewpoint or a vantage point uh, from heaven on how he looks down on his people. Because this is how he sees you and, and this is what's cool about the church and being covered by his, his son's blood. He, how he sees us. You are a royal priesthood. You're part of this holy nation called the church. The book of Hebrews talks so much about that, 
about this is, this is your role and this is what's been made available to you. And, and even Peter talks about it in the letters that he wrote. You're a royal priesthood. This is who you are. I don't feel like a priest. What's a priest? Well, it's not really necessarily what we've created it to be. But no, you're a part of, you're part of the kingdom of God. And what's kind of fascinating about that, if, if you, you know, fast forward, so to speak, into the New Testament and how this royal priesthood kind of applies to believers today, in our mindset, how we view priests as the, you know, they can like pray on behalf of us or pray for us to God and all that good stuff. Well, I mean, there's that. Um, but you as a believer can pray for other people. You can come alongside them and say, hey, what do you need? Do you need, do you need prayer for something? Our friends at the nursing home. You can stand, you're a part of the royal priesthood. You can pray for them to God. It's amazing. It's an amazing thing. It's, it's such a tremendous blessing. And I, uh, to be honest with you, I don't do, I don't do as, as well at this as what I would like to. I have friends who put me to shame when it comes to praying for people, right? I got, and I've probably mentioned them before, but I got the Hodge, the Hodges brothers, right? Brian and Russ. Um, anytime I see these guys, they both live in Corpus Christi right now. Uh, they're from Vega, Texas, which is a small little bitty farm town up north or west, I'm sorry, of Amarillo. And our paths crossed in, in the church in Amarillo. And I cannot, anytime I, I mean, come in contact with these guys, most of the time I'm up there filling in for Bill teaching. If those, one of those two guys are there, this is what I know. When I see them before I go up there, they're going to be like, hey, you know what? Let me pray for you right, real quick. Every single time. Every single time. When we're talking to each other, hey, you know what? Let me go ahead and pray for you right now. And that's, just, that's just what they do. And I love that. And I'm like, man, I should be more like that. <laughs> I should be more like that. And this is what's kind of cool about, you know, just being a follower of Christ is you, you have this this beautiful opportunity to say to somebody, you know what, can I pray for you right now? There's no screen. There's no hidden thing. There's no divider. No, it's like, I just, you, you, you need prayer for something? Can I just, let's just pray right now. Let's pray right now. It's, it's such a sweet thing. And here God is establishing this for the children of Israel in the, in the, right there on the mount, at the base of the mount of Mount Sinai. You're a royal priesthood. You're a chosen people, a holy nation, set apart, distinct from all the other nations. So Moses, verse 7, returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him. And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. <laughs> um, I laugh at that because I know the rest of the story. <laughs> it's like, yes, everything you say to do, we will do. And then my mind flashes forward to the book of Joshua where the children of Israel are like, whatever God says, we will do. And then it goes to the book of Judges. Whatever God says, we will do. And it's like, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've acted like that too. Oh Lord, whatever you say, Lord, whatever you say. This time, this time, Lord, whatever you say, I'm going to do it. And he's like, well, we'll see about that. Um, and praise God for his kindness that leads to repentance. Okay, so they're like, yeah, whatever he says, everything, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answers, answer back to the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will come to you in a thick cloud, Moses, so the people themselves can hear me when I speak with you. Then they will always trust you. Moses told the Lord what the people had said. Okay, uh, there you go. He told them, he replied back, hey, listen, God, they said they're all in. They're all in. All right. And so the Lord says to Moses, verse 10, go down and prepare the people for my arrival. Consecrate them. Okay, clean house. You got a clean house. You got a guest coming. And it's the, big, the, the biggest and the best guest ever. God is showing up. You better get clean. You better get ready, right? So he says, consecrate, um, consecrate them today and tomorrow and have them wash their clothing. Be sure they are ready on the third day. For on that day, the Lord will come down, uh, come down on Mount Sinai as all the people watch. Mark off a boundary all around the mountain. Warn the people, be careful. Do not go up on the mountain or even touch its boundaries. Anyone who touches the mountain will, will certainly be put to death. No hand may touch the 
the person or the animal that crosses the boundary, just in case somebody does, right? Instead, stone them or shoot them with arrows. I think this is pretty serious business, right? Like that, those do not touch signs, you know, in stores. This is like to an extreme. We got our, our archers are right over there in case you do. So they're going to take you out. But here's God saying like, I'm holy. I'm holy. You can't come near me. I'm holy. Even my presence on a mountain. If you come and touch this mountain, you will die. You will die. And this is like, and here's Moses. He's got to communicate this to the people. They must be put to death. The verse goes on. However, when the ram's horn uh, sounds a long blast or the shofar, then the people may go up on the mountain. So you got to wait for the all clear sign. Don't jump the gun. Just it's, it's what? It's about reverence. It's about respect. So Moses went down to the people. He consecrated them for worship and they washed their clothes. He told them, get ready for the third day. And until then, abstain from having sexual intercourse for three days, right? That's like, he's like, he's just serious, right? We don't know if, technically, you don't know if, the, if that's part of the rules that the Lord had thrown into there. It could have been with the, with the original command, or it could be just Moses being like, look, here's the deal, guys. Three days, three days. Just keep, let's wash our clothes. We're going to set ourselves apart. We are going to be focused on what? We're going to be focused on when the Lord shows up. We're going to be anticipating his arrival. We're going to be ready. On the morning of the third day, thunder roared and lightning flashed and a dense cloud came down on the mountain. There was a long, loud blast from the ram's horn or from the shofar and all the people trembled. Moses led them out from the camp to meet with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. All of Mount Sinai was covered with smoke because the Lord had descended on it in the form of fire. So Moses got the burning bush. Children of Israel get the burning mountain. This is like major, major. I mean, you can, you can just envision like the whole encampment, you know, all, all of these guys can be kind of almost surrounding this mountain, right? And then there's the presence of God. So the smoke billowed into the sky like smoke from a brick kiln, right? So just a ton of just smoke, just pillars of smoke. And the whole mountain shook violently. As the blast of the, roar, the ram's horn grew louder and louder, Moses spoke, and God thundered his reply. The Lord came down on the top of Mount Sinai and called Moses to the top of the mountain. So Moses climbed the mountain. Then the Lord told Moses, go back down and warn the people not to break through the boundaries to see the Lord or they will die. Even the priests who regularly come near to the Lord must purify themselves so that the Lord does not break out and destroy them. But Lord, Moses protested, the people cannot come, cannot come up to, the Mount, to Mount Sinai. You, you've already warned us. You told me, mark off a boundary all around the mountain to set it apart as holy. But the Lord said, go down and bring Aaron back up with you. In the meantime, do not let the priests or the people break through uh, to approach the Lord or he will break out and destroy them. So Moses went down to the people and told them what the Lord had said. All right, so here you go. So Moses is up there. The people are hearing these thunderings. They, they're hearing God speaking to Moses is what it is, right? And, and so Moses is having this tremendous like interaction. I, I mean, you can... if. If you're ever going to put yourself in a story, you put yourself in the, the shoes or sandals of, the, of an Israelite. As you're watching this, you're looking up. I mean, this mountain is just covered. It's just covered. There's, there's thunder and there's lightning and, and it's fire and there's smoke everywhere. And the mountain itself is shaking. And Moses is going up this thing. And he's speaking with God. And there's the thunderings. And that's the people. They are hearing God speak to Moses. And what this is really communicating, and the word, the term was thrown out there a few times, but it, it's the holiness of God. The holiness of God. There should be a, and I use this, this, this term in, in my prayer, there should be a reverence for God, an absolute respect for who he is. Sometimes we lose that, I think, especially in modern days, Right? Because we, you know, we, we like to tag him as like, well, no, yeah, God's my best friend and, and all this good stuff. 
yeah, I get it, but he's God Almighty. He is God Almighty. He is holy. He is distinct. There is no other God like him. The, there's, there's nothing else like him. I mean, he is all-powerful, all-knowing. He is everywhere. He is God. And he showed up on Mount Sinai to speak to his people. And the children of Israel were more than willing to use, to have Moses speak and, re- speak and hear on behalf of them in one sense. Because they get, they're kind of getting it now, right? They, they should have, you know, gotten this when they, well, even when Moses showed up in Egypt and was like, hey, the God of your fathers, the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham, he sent me here to rescue you from bondage, from slavery. They should have gotten it then. They didn't. They watched all these plagues and everything happened. They should have gotten it then, but they didn't get it then. And then they got to leave and, and they, they got the parting of the Red Sea and they got the bitter waters turned to sweet waters. They got the manna. They got the quell. They got all the stuff. They got the pillar of clouds and the pillar of fire. They got the angel of the Lord was present in, in some of those stories. But it never dawned on them. It never really clicked. And then now they're at the foot of the mountain of God and he shows up. And here's what's crazy. Even this story does not change them at all it doesn't change them because I'm looking at this and I'm like holy cow what if the presence of God descended down in Calvary Galveston today we should all be on our faces out of adoration out of true worship out of a little bit of fear (laughs) and tremendous amounts of respect And I'm not saying that these people didn't respond that way, but what we do know is we know the rest of the story and none of these people except for two, a handful of these guys in one sense, there's a whole other generation that rises up after them. So not counting the kids here, but this generation is wiped out. They don't even make it into the promised land. And they have this encounter with God. This can be very common in church today. You could show up to a place, and you're like, man, the music was off the charts. I felt the presence of God. The teaching was amazing. It's like the Lord was speaking directly to me. And I left that place on what? A mountaintop experience. Cool. Sweet. Did it change you? Did it transform you? Did it cause you to grow closer to Jesus? Did it cause your, whatever your spiritual state is, to become a little bit more mature? Well, but it was a pretty sweet time. Cool. Um, sounds like a Exodus chapter 19 story to me. And I'm not saying anything about, you know, having those feelings and that emotions and that encounter. The encounters are meant to change people. When God shows up, the intent is for transformation. And the intent is for transformation because of this. He is holy and we are are supposed to be holy. He is holy. And I am far from it to a certain extent. But compared to the world, we are holy. We are holy. So when God descends on the mountain, so to speak, and shows up in your life, I hope, I hope and I pray that you walk away from that story, I walk away from those stories like a Joshua and like a Caleb who are like, sweet, let's go to the promised land, let's go kill some giants because I've been changed. I saw them, I heard them, I'm fired up. I'm gonna fight giants and tell them 80 years old, Caleb. I can tell you this, you go to heaven, you go hang out with Joshua and Caleb and be like, tell me about Exodus 19. They'll be like, you wouldn't believe it. He showed up, God showed up. 
And everybody else, they said the right stuff, but it did not change them. It didn't change them. But here's God. He shows up and he's going to lay down. He's going to lay down like, here's what I expect from you guys. This is, this is what you are entering into. This is a covenant. This is a relationship. And these are not a set of rules. This is a set of like, this is how you ought to live because this is who I am. So we'll go right into chapter 20. The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. Um, you, can, you can do this. You can go and just ask people, maybe friends you have, family members, maybe just some stranger on the road, and be like, hey, um, list the Ten Commandments for me. <clears throat> and you'd be surprised by how many people actually can't do it. I think we'd be even more surprised about how many people in the church can't do it. <laughs> that, I mean, that's the thing. Is I, I was just reading the story of this congressman who um, <clears throat> was pressing to have, like, the Ten Commandments um, posted in certain places within the, the nation's capital. And when asked, like, well, by a reporter, basically, is like, well, what are the Ten Commandments? And he's like, well, um, there's a don't steal, don't lie, don't kill. And that's about all he knew. <laughs> and he was so gung-ho to get these things plastered on all this stuff. And it's like, you don't even know what this says. You don't even know. We, we should know what these things are because these things really, um, they really communicate. They, they, they shape our worldview, so to speak. This kind of gives you a good biblical worldview. The first four uh, deal with our relationship with the Lord. So the first four will be vertical, okay? Then the, the last six, five through 10, those are horizontal, you know? And I talk about this a lot. And there's a reason why I talk about this a lot is because it's found in scripture a lot. The vertical, and that's why they come first, one, two, three, and four all speak about the vertical. Because five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten don't happen unless this is good. Not like it should. So that's why the vertical and the horizontal thing, that's so important to us. Your relationship with God personally matters so much because the overflow directly affects other people. And that's, that's how these are, these are all, you know, kind of set up. And you can break them down in different ways and all that good stuff. But let's, let's read through this. And then I'm going to read something for you guys that kind of helps to, to break it down even, even a little bit further. It says, God gave the people all these instructions, the commandments. Not rules. They're instructions, okay? Because rules. Nobody likes rules. You tell people, here's the ten rules. And they're like, I don't follow rules right? Because none of us are really good at following the rules, except for some people. Some are better than others. Uh, but you use that word rule, and then immediately people will tune you out. Here's 10 instructions, basically. Verse 2, he says, I am the Lord your God, who rescued you from the land of Egypt, the place of your slavery. You must not have any other God but me. And even in the, the Hebrew there, he's saying basically this, there are oh, no other gods. There are no other gods but me. So don't establish something in my place. Very simple. Don't elevate something to a place where it does not deserve. It doesn't belong there. What's the filter that that needs to run through? Well, did that thing ever die for you so that you wouldn't go to hell? The answer to all that is no. No. Only Jesus did. So only he deserves the top spot in our lives. So whatever is an idol, destroy it, so to speak. Just deal with it. Make it, it that's, that's the thing. Whether it's stuff or, you know, it could be wealth. It could be materials or it could be, it could be relationships. It could be family. Family. Yeah, it could be family. You, we, we are so good at elevating family above God. We just are, right? I, I do that all the time. I can, I can, I'm guilty of that for sure. It's not fair to whoever that person is, and it's just not right. It's just not right. Keep the Lord numero uno in your life, period. And then run everything through the filter. 
did this, did this die on the cross for my sins? No, no, it did not. Did your bank account save you from hell? No, it didn't and it never will. Did your cool car or your whatever stuff? No, it didn't and it never will. So don't put it in the place of God. Only he did that. Only he deserves to be number one. He goes on to say, to elaborate a little bit more on that, with the, the next commandment, that was number one, right? Number one, no other gods but me. Two, you must, or verse four, but commandment two, you must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of anything in the heavens or on the earth or in the sea. Okay, you must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for other gods. I love it. We think of jealousy as like a bad thing. It is for us most of the time, usually because we're so insecure or we're paranoid or whatever. And we're like, oh no, what, what, who are they talking to? Who, what's, what's this? It's just, it's, it's crazy. It's insecurity is what it is. God's not insecure. But you just go back to commandment number one. Who died for you? I did. Don't you dare put anything in my place because nothing deserves his, the affection rightly uh, directed towards him. He will not tolerate it. He will not put up with it. Don't try him on it. Don't test him on it. Just receive that and be like, you know what, Lord? You're right. Back then... Oftentimes, deities, you know, a lot of false gods and stuff, images were created, and that was their, like, point of reference for worship. So you create, like, an image or an idol or something like that, and then that thing almost served as a mediator between you and the real God that's the image of it or whatever, okay? Quote, unquote. And that's why people would have those established within their homes or they, you know, they would bow down to these things. The purpose behind all that was to serve the needs of the God. And here's God who says, I don't need anything. I'm God. I don't need anything from you. So just worship me. And he's speaking against all these other false gods that they're about to encounter as they go into their promised land. Whether it's the Canaanites with their false god or, or you know, you just name it. They, they all had basically their own kind of, you know, quiver of gods, so to speak, whether it's Baal or Ashtaroth or um, Molech or, or you just, the list goes on and on and on. You can include Zeus in there. You can include, um, you know, you name it, Hades or, or Hermes or whoever all these other guys were. Um, don't establish any image because no image if it's a stone statue it it has eyes but can't he can't see it has ears but can't hear it has a mouth but it can't speak it's deaf dumb and mute why in the world would you bow down and pray to that thing it can't intercede on behalf of you however jesus can't and jesus does and god's like no don't don't establish any pictures and all that stuff and, and this is and we tend to we go a little crazy with this stuff i mean um, my son, the Monday, um, brought home a picture of, <laughs> a picture of Jesus, um, quote unquote, okay? Could be Jesus, could have been Jesus. I don't know who it was, but um, it was a picture of this guy depicted as Jesus, right? Very European. Um, and I'm, my first thing was like, I'm pearl. I was like, who brought the creepy picture of Jesus home, right? Like, what is this? Um, now, that because we don't know what Jesus looks like so and all that good stuff but I don't like I didn't take that and throw it into the fireplace and burn it and scold my son or it's actually sitting by his bed right I just walked past his room and it's on his nice hand by his bed I'm, I'm gonna leave it alone I'm gonna leave it alone um he's not committing idolatry he's not committing idolatry okay uh we can go like really crazy on some of this stuff I think we understand don't bow down and more so in, within our hearts, don't pledge allegiance to something that did not die on the cross for you. Don't bow down to worship something that doesn't deserve your adoration. Not like God does. And he's telling his people, you got to be different. You have to be different because I'm different. He goes on to say, 
concerning that, yeah, within that, that same verse there, verse 5, uh, he says, you know, I'm a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other gods. I lay the sins upon, uh, of the parents upon their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the third and fourth gener generation of those who reject me. But, because in case we get a little depressed about that last verse, you're like, oh my goodness. But, however, I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. So here's the wisdom. Love him and obey his commands. <laughs> Just love him and obey his commands. Verse 7, you must not misuse the name of the Lord your God. The Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name or take his name in vain. Here's the other one we go a little sideways with. Taking the, name, the Lord's name in vain. Here's my understanding of what this has been from a child. If you say God, or you attach a little thing to the end of that, or oh my, OMG, then that's, you're taking the Lord's name in vain. Now, that might be dishonoring and disrespecting the name of God, but that's technically not what it's saying. And I think it's wise for us Christians to really clarify this, because taking the Lord's name in vain happens a whole lot every single Sunday morning. Because technically what this is talking about, it's this taking his name. It, this is speaking against those who know and understand the power behind the name and seek to exploit it. That's what taking the Lord's name in vain means. It's ones who are, they understand the power of the name of Jesus. And in the name of Jesus, I'm going to proclaim this. And in the name of Jesus, I'm claiming this. That's taking his name in vain. Technically, literally, that's taking his name in vain. That's what this is talking about. Don't disrespect his name. Don't dishonor his name. Don't attach a curse word to his name. That's disrespectful. But I think it's smart for us to call out the true meaning behind this. The Lord has given me a word that somebody in this room needs to give a thousand dollars. That's taking his name in vain. Because you are calling upon his name and using that to exploit, to gain from his name. If you use his name to gain something from it, you are taking his name in vain. Period. And there are pastors across this world that commit this sin every single Sunday. And it's sad because they don't even know. They don't even know what this means. Because what they would say is, well, no, you don't curse God. You don't use his name as a curse word. That's true. However, I can't stand up here and give you a quote-unquote word from God that really just benefits me. That's taking his name in vain. That has to stop. That's what he's saying. Don't use my name for your own personal gain. Don't call upon my name because there is power in his name. There is absolute power in the name of Jesus. Absolutely. Jesus even said in that model prayer, hallowed be your name. It's when, we, it's when we, we, we understand that and then we seek to exploit it. Well, that's when you're taking his name in vain. And that's what we have to be cautious of, is using his name to get what I want. Because even that goes beyond just the pulpit and into the pews, so to speak, where we're naming and claiming stuff that really we don't, it's not about need, it's about want, and I'm claiming this in the name of Jesus. That's technically... You're breaking the command. You're breaking the command. That's taking his, that's, you're using his name to, to gain. That's not what, how it's supposed to be. Do you have needs? Of course you do. You call upon him as the good shepherd to provide for your needs. Do you have wants that you address to God? Of course you do. And that's okay to say, God, I don't know if I technically need this, but man, I really would like to have this. That's perfectly fine to pray that way. I would just caution all of us 
from claiming something in the name of Jesus just simply so that you kind of get what you want. There's no benefit to the kingdom at all. It's not even about other people. There's no real glory and praise to God. It's about satisfying your own need or your own want and desire, I should say. It's like somebody's stealing your credit card and they're swiping away. And it's your name, it's your identification, but they're abusing that to get what they want. It's the same thing that's being spoken of here. Don't take the Lord's name in vain, okay? He says, the Lord will not let you go unpunished if you misuse his name. <laughs> so there is a warning there of like, oh, you just, he's like, oh, okay. All right, I got you. I got you. Okay. <laughs> so Moses, is commu he's communicating all this stuff. Here's the other one. Remember to observe the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath day of rest dedicated to the Lord your God. On that day, no one in your household may do any work. Can I get an amen from the children in the room? There's none. Um, I guess if there's one back there, and he's like, sweet, no chores. Um, technically, you gotta have a, a day to chill out, right? And we talked about this before. He, he goes on to say, this includes you, your sons, your daughters, your male and female servants, your livestock, and any foreigners living with you. For in six days, the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. But on the seventh day, he rested. That is why the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and set it apart, set it apart as holy. So take a break, rest. There's got to be a day where you don't do anything. You're like, I don't have, there are not eight days in the week for that to be possible. You need to restructure your week. You need to reprioritize your life. I can't, well, work towards it. Set that as your goal. You got seven days. Try to figure out as best as you can how to get all the work and everything you need to accomplish within six days and leave one day where what? Where you just do nothing? No, technically that's not what this is saying. This is saying trust God with your life, the sovereign God, so that one day a week you can devote to him basically for service, for service. So that could be Sundays. Look, I'm helping you out. Sunday mornings, like go to church. That's what he wants. He wants just a day where it's, you get to come and you, you hear the word and you, you sing songs and, and worship and praise and all that good stuff. And then you go home and you, you go or go to a restaurant if you do that stuff. And then you eat a decent meal, I'm sure, I hope. And you leave a very generous tip. If you're not, you, you need to repent um, and then you go home and you chill out and you enjoy and then you just chew on maybe what was taught that day and just relax relax the Lord says look I, it took me six days man I made everything and I rested on the seventh day and I'm holy and you ought to be holy this is who I am this is how I am this is how you should be and we cannot stand in defiance of God of any of these commandments. And even on the one concerning the rest. Now, you may go like the spiritualizing of this and be like, well, Jesus is my rest. <laughs> yes, true. That's true. However, the physical speaks towards this in the sense that your body needs it. Your mind needs it. Your emotional state needs it science the, there is an actual thing called science um and it's very real and it's very practical okay and i don't think it's as weird as it's been this last year okay because there's very there's a lot of things scientifically speaking that we can really bank on your body needing a day of rest is scientifically true it's true i mean unless you don't want to live longer <laughs> I don't, but see, even then, that, that mindset is like, well, I'm just, I'm just going to get to heaven quicker. I'm like, that's dumb. That doesn't make sense. Like, no, you should take a break, rest, rest. Just see what happens. 
rest. You know, take up a hobby. Go fishing or something. Um, do something where it's like you're not thinking. And you're, not, you're, just, you're just worshiping. That's the point of a Sabbath is you're just worshiping. The Lord established this. And his people are going to fail miserably at this. And then they're going to make all these extra rules of like, you can only take this many steps on a Sabbath day. And you're like, what in the world? It's, it's crazy. So we press on into the other ones here. Let's talk about the, uh, the, the horizontal, okay? And then it starts with the family unit, kind of works its way outward. It says, uh, honor your father and mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land the Lord your God is giving you. Um, number one, probably because they won't kill you, okay? I mean, that's probably like the practical application there, right? You're like, you're dishonoring mom and dad. Well, there's a chance you might not make it, okay? So there's that first and foremost. Um, if you're not listening to their wisdom, you might wander off and do something stupid and it costs you. So there's very practical things with this, but then there's also just the honoring side of it in the sense that this is your, your father and your mother. You need to honor them in the sense of, and when it speaks of this honoring, it is speaking of just like acknowledging the fact that, well, I didn't pick them. They didn't pick me, so to speak. Um, God has brought this thing together. And so how can I honor them as unto the Lord? would be the way to, to say that, as unto the Lord. Now, if mom or dad is, is calling upon you to act or to live your life in a way that is contrary to what the scriptures say, well, then you, you, you honor them by, well, not agreeing with them and not living that way in that sense. Um, but they're your mom, they're your dad, and it may not be a perfect picture, it may not be the perfect family and all that stuff, but we really just need to figure out, well, how can I honor my mother and my father? Right, And in this world that we live in, that's very, really complicated because there's no perfect family. Now, one parental may be a lot easier to honor than the other one. But it doesn't say honor them if they're good parents. It says honor your mom and dad. I had to do that last year. That was what I had to figure out was like, my dad died. I didn't get a chance really to reconnect with him. And then he just, out of the blue, he just passed away. And I was left, I really was left with this, Lord, how do I honor him? How do I honor him? Because, like, as far as I know, my chance is gone. Like, I never honored him on this planet when he was alive. I didn't. I dishonored him. I totally dishonored him. And there were times where, even when I was preaching, I would not the way I would talk about him wasn't honoring to him. He wasn't, per se, a good guy. I don't think he earned it. But I did have my pastor who pulled me aside one day and said, hey, he's still your dad. You still need to honor him. And I was like, oh. That was one of those things where I was like, yeah. I'm like, no, but you don't know my story. Well, he kind of does. He kind of does. So the way I feel is though the Lord, op the Lord totally opened up this door for me to honor him by doing his funeral. I didn't ask to do it. My family actually approached me and said, you're a pastor, would you be willing to do his funeral? And it was immediately the Lord spoke to me. He says, this is how you honor him. This, will, this is how you honor him. And that's what I got to do. I never honored him while he was alive. Not at all. But I got to honor him post, you know, in that sense. It may not be pretty. It may not be perfect. But I want to stand before the Lord saying, you know what, Lord? Um, man, I, I failed a lot. Um, but I, I really, I'm not trying to get these things perfect. We're, the, the law is just simply meant to bring us to a place where you know, I can't do this. I just can't do this. And in one sense, that's where we all, we're all being driven to that, to that point. And even with that, because I don't know your family dynamic or your situation, but it, if it, even if it just leads you to the point where you're like, man, Lord, I can't do this. I need you to help me to do this. There's, there's ways where he can come through for you on that. For me, it was a funeral. It was a funeral because I told the Lord, I'm like, I can't. How do I? I can't. 
we go through this list to be driven to the point of like, man, Lord, um, like commandment number one, I'm, I'm broken so many times. <laughs> I'm broken so many times. I'm just guilty. You don't even have to go down the rest of the list. And I've seen guys use this with like street witnessing tactics. And I'm like, number one, numero uno, I'm like, I've already broke it. Okay, I broke it. You don't even have to get to the lying and the stealing. I've already broken the 10 commandments, okay? And it drives us to a place where it's like, Lord, I can't do this on my own. And he's like, exactly, exactly. I never intended for you to do it on your own. So the list goes on. Uh, you must not murder. Well, okay, that sounds, you know, <laughs> I mean, that's, we actually find that in laws, uh, Hammurabi's code and all that stuff. Like most ancient civilizations were like, you know, I think murdering's bad, right? We've all kind of come to this agreement that taking the life of somebody else is not a good thing. Now, just so you understand the term here for murder, uh, it's, it's not the general word for killing. It's homicide. It, it speaks more to homicide because I have heard this brought up concerning warfare. God's word says you're not supposed to murder. So why are we sending our soldiers over there and they're killing people? Well, technically, it's not the same word. It's not the same word. This word is speaking of homicide the brutality of that and you are taking the life of an individual this isn't about like defending other people or defending a nation or, or anything like that this isn't even speaking of like capital punishment because that's not even this that's not talked about here as well this is specifically and only talking about homicide you must not murder don't kill. Don't kill each other. That's bad. I think we get that. And that's like, if the vertical is good, then this is never even a part of the equation. However, Jesus came onto the scene and he messed it all up because then he said, oh no, it's yes, physically, but also are you murdering them in your heart? Because it's the same thing. And you're like, oh, guilty. Do you hate somebody? murder that's homicide it's homicide Jesus says if you, even if you, you hate somebody else it's the same thing you must not commit adultery alright that's easy enough well is it because Jesus kind of messed this one up too because a lot of people are like oh sweet okay the murder thing I haven't done that one so check uh, the adultery thing I haven't done that one and then Jesus is like yeah but have you ever lusted and you're like um do you, how did you know about that and he's like ah oh, yeah you're, it's, you're guilty you're guilty because it isn't always an issue of the physical act it's an issue of the heart and what's happening on the, in the inside of your heart and if you've ever lusted well then you've committed the you've committed adultery within your heart guilty guilty you must not steal. Don't steal. Don't take what's not yours. You must not testify falsely against your neighbor. Okay? That's, this is, again, this is overflowing into this, this horizontal thing here. Uh, you must not covet your neighbor's house. You must not covet your neighbor's wife, male or female servant, ox or donkey, or anything else that belongs to your neighbor. Being envious is one thing, but coveting is, envious is like, I want something like they have. Covetousness is, I want what they have. It's like, oh, man, I would love to have a new car like so-and-so has. Covetousness is, I want that car. Oh, I'd love to have a spouse like so-and-so has. Covetous says, no, I want their spouse. So you can understand that, I mean, there's definitely a distinction that's there. And when you get into more of those personal relationships, you can, you can tell the, just the evilness behind it, right? It's, it's, it's desiring what somebody else has to the point of like, you got re you gotta revisit that do not steal thing because like that's the seeds that are getting planted. And those things kind of take form. They take life and you gotta, we gotta deal with that stuff. But these are the here's the Ten Commandments. It's all listed and it's all laid out. Moses is going to deliver this to the people. Here's Moses comes down. Now, please note, he doesn't have the tablets with him. 
Um, they're not like creating a golden calf yet. All that story is to come later, right? Because we see the, you know, the, the movie, you know, and you're like, oh, they, they cross the Red Sea and then they do this, this story and then he goes up on the mountain and he gets the tablets and he comes down and he smashes them because they're created an altar, you're this golden calf. That doesn't even happen yet. Here's, they get the Ten Commandments spoken by God and then it makes that other story all that much more interesting it, it, when it gets written down. But here, here are the people. They hear the thunder, verse 18, 18, yeah. They hear the thunder and the loud blast from the, the, the shofar, the ram's horn. And when they saw the flashes of lightning and the smoke billowing from the mountain, they stood at a distance, trembling with fear. And they said to Moses, you speak to us. <laughs> uh, Moses, here's the deal. Um, God is terrifying us. We only want to hear from you. So let him talk to you and then you talk to us because he is scaring us. And you can, you can envision this as like at one point in time, they're like really close to the mountain, you know, as close to the boundary as they probably can get. Over the course of the Ten Commandments coming down, they're like taking steps back. They're like, um, <laughs> they're like, hey, Moses, you, you feel, feel free to speak on behalf of us, buddy. You, you, you're the guy, you're the man, okay? So they, they say, you speak to us, we will listen, but don't let God speak directly to us or we will die. Maybe some of the realities of the Ten Commandments are like settling home with them as they're like checking off their own list and they're like, okay, Ten Commandments, all right, here we go. Uh, no other gods. Oh man, okay, I failed that one. Um, the next one, uh, the Lord's, you know, no idols. Oh man, hey, get rid of those things. Get rid of those idols, those Egyptian idols that we stole from Egypt. Cross off that one. You can tell that probably as they're going down the list, they're realizing we're sinners. We're busted. We're busted. And there is a proper, there is a reverence that happens there. There is a fear that takes place there. Moses says, don't be afraid. For God is coming this way to test you and so that you, so that your fear of him will keep you from sinning. Okay? This fear you have, yeah, let it be your motivator. Okay? To not do, do not commit any of these things we just talked about. As the people stood in the distance, Moses approached the dark cloud where God was. So he like goes into this dark cloud, okay? Um, just crazy, crazy visual that happens there as Moses just kind of disappears into the cloud, so to speak. Then the last little bit here. And the Lord said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. You saw for yourselves that I spoke to you from heaven. Remember, you must not make any idols of silver or gold to rival me okay this will be a problem for them later on build for me an altar made of earth and offer your sacrifices to me your burnt offerings and peace offerings your sheep and goats and your cattle build my altar wherever I cause my name to be remembered and I will come to you and bless you if you use stones to build my altar use only natural uncut stones do not shape the stones with the tool for that would make the altar unfit for holy use. He's like, I don't need any fancy altars. Just kind of like how I construct stuff. Like, just, you know, just put it together. <laughs> like, just put it together. It'll be fine. And do not, this is, a, this is the, the funny verse that I, every time I come across this, I just always start cracking up. Um, do not approach my altar by going up steps. If you do, someone might look up under your clothing and see your nakedness. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, I love God. It's so awesome. Where he's like, oh, by the way, guys, you may not realize this, but if you build these steps, you guys aren't wearing any undergarments yet, okay? That will be established later, okay? But God's like, look, save yourself the embarrassment. Um, don't make any steps, okay? And they're like, why? What's he talking about? Oh, oh, I get it. Okay, yeah, thanks for looking out for us, God. <laughs> I, I love that. Um, I love that that is included in there. That's just, man, if that doesn't highlight how awesome God is, I don't know what, I don't know what's going to do it for you. But here he is. He's like, oh, guys, listen, um, just so you know, uh, the underwear will come down, will come later. Okay. So right now, no steps, no steps. We're going to, we don't want any embarrassing moments. Okay. And I can't even imagine what these people were, were, what happened or the expressions that came across their faces when that last little bit was said, right? And you're like, wait, what? Like, really? 
Okay, Asia, that's good advice. Um, there you go. So here's the Lord just laying this stuff down. You got the Ten Commandments. It's going to progress. 21, 22, 23, 24 all speak about how these guys ought to interact with each other. Whether it's with your employees or your livestock and, and all that good stuff, the Lord is just laying down like, listen, this is who I am. This is how I expect you to be. This is what you signed up for, so to speak. Um, this is honoring. He's a, he's a holy God, and we ought to be holy people. So time is running out. Um, <clears throat> what we'll do, what I'll do next week, because I mentioned I was going to read something to you guys. I'll, I'm going to save this here, and I'll read it, uh, not next Wednesday, um, but two weeks from today, actually. We'll pick back up but in 21. But I'll, I'll read you guys this about these commandments. But um I, I do have some questions for discussion time. I know our time is short, so you guys can uh, you guys can do what you feel like you need to within the discussion time. But um, if I can get those up there, there, there you go. Um, so first question, yes. Okay, there you go. You don't have to worry about that one. Are the Ten Commandments relevant today? Yes, they are. They are, totally are. I mean, if you think they're irrelevant, oh man, um, please don't steal any of my stuff. Um, please just please go back to the bible and these things are absolutely relevant the second one uh you can go into the how so but the second one how does loving god and loving others sum up the law okay so you can take those discuss those or you can either because we got like seven minutes um i think that clock's fast but you got about 10 minutes you can just pray for each other I'm going to leave that up to you guys to determine. We'll leave these questions up here. And then for anybody watching online, um, in case you can't, I'll get out of the way. But um, feel free to, in the comment section, you can answer and all that good stuff. If you have prayer requests, and this is speaking to people online because we actually have a lot of people watching online. If you have prayer requests for anything, please let us know how we can pray for you guys. Okay? Um, we, do, we know we have needs, and, and some people have been reaching out through email and, and letting us know that they have prayer requests. Uh, Melanie... Melanie, uh, one of our friends, uh, she's in the hospital right now, um, and so she needs our prayer. Uh, our friend Nate, the intern, he needs prayer for a place. Um, we, we, we have needs, and so, and that goes for everybody in the room as well. If you have prayer requests, please write those down or go to calvarygalveston at gmail.com and email those prayer requests. We want to make sure that we're praying, okay? So let me pray. You guys get into your groups, and we'll, we'll close out the service. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, we thank you, Lord, that you are our, our mediator. Lord, we can look at this list that's been thrown out there, and, and we all stand uh, guilty, <laughs> Lord, if we're honest. And, and, but what I, what I love, Lord, is that you fulfilled the law. You fulfilled the law. And, and Lord, man, we, we have direct access into the Holy of Holies, because of what you did for us on the cross and raising from the grave three days later. And, and we don't have righteousness on our own, Lord. We're covered by your righteousness. And I'm just so grateful, Lord, that we don't have to stand in fear at the mountain of Sinai. Because of what you did for us on the cross, we have direct ac access into the Holy of Holies. And I pray that that's what people see. And I pray that, that as believers, as Christians, we realize that. We don't have to tremble in fear, so to speak. I, I pray that we never lose the reverence. But Lord, I pray that we would embrace the freedom and the joy that we have to be able to hang out with you anytime we want. It truly is a beautiful thing, Lord. And we thank you for doing that for us. Thank you for dying on the cross, for raising from the grave. Thank you for saving us. And thank you, Lord, that you care about us. May we be holy as you are holy, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.